Hello guys and welcome to another calculus video. In this video we are going to be exploring the amazing world of higher dimension calculus. We're going to be trying to create a general formula for the volume of a hypersphere. When I say a hypersphere, I just mean a sphere that's been extended into higher dimensions. So I have a little example here. This is a one-dimensional sphere and it's essentially, it's really just a line and it's basically defined by x squared is less than or equal to 1. And then we also have a two-dimensional sphere, better known as a circle, or in this case, more accurately, it's a disk. And you can define it by x squared plus y squared plus, or x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 1. Or I guess we could put r squared here as well, if you want. And then here we have a three-dimensional sphere, which is just a normal sphere. So the idea is that we can also generalize this into higher dimensions. So we can imagine another sphere, a hypersphere, so to speak, where instead of having this formula, it's really defined by the formula x squared plus y squared plus c squared plus, I don't know, alpha squared is less than or equal to r squared. So we could have a sphere in another dimension. And what we want to figure out is the formula for the volume or I'm not really sure what the volume, uh, the, the term for volume in higher dimensions generally is, but I'm just going to be using volume of that hypersphere is. So let's go through the formulas that we already know. When we're talking about volume in one dimension, it's really just the length of this line, which is clearly, if we call this the center and this is going to be r, it's just going to be 2r. With the circle, it's pretty straightforward. It's just going to be pi r squared. And with the sphere, we know that it's 4 thirds pi r cubed. So we want to figure out what it is. Um, this would, these would be v1 of r, right? This would be v2 of r. And we want to figure out a general formula that we, we can use to figure out vn of r. So let's go ahead and jump right into the problem. Now, first off, I want to prove this really, uh, this really quick, um, property of this function and I want to show that it's equal to r to the n times vn of 1. All this is saying is that first off this would be the volume of a uh, unit hypersphere and this would be the volume of any hypersphere with any radius and all we're doing here is multiplying by r to the n. So essentially all we're saying is every hypersphere is the same as um, a hypersphere with radius 1 it's just stretched out by our units, right? And so when we multiply each side, essentially, by a factor of r, or each dimension by a factor of r, uh, we end up in increasing the volume by a factor of r to the n. So think about if you double the size of the line, then the length of the line doubles, obviously. So that doesn't that wasn't a really good example. But if you double the width and the height of a circle, then the area is going to quadruple. So that would be multiplying by 2 um, is becomes 2 squared and if you double the length of a um, if you double the width the height and the depth in a sphere you're gonna get eight times the original volume so that's all this is really saying and it's just logic based um, I'm sure there's a way to represent it mathematically but I'm not really familiar with higher dimensional calculus as I've said um, so this is just a pretty straightforward thing that we're going to be using so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to solve for Vn of 1 for all n, and then we're going to generalize it to Vn of r. So first off, let's look at how we actually can jump between dimensions. So when we're trying to find the, vol uh, the area of a circle, the way that we do this is we split it up into really thin rectangles, right, with width dx, and then we sum them all up, and that just becomes an integral. So we end up, I'm just going to be talking about, again, unit. Uh, unit hyperspheres, so this is just going to be essentially the integral from negative 1 to 1 of 2, um, 2 times square root 1 minus x squared dx. And when we solve for this, we're going to, of course, just get pi, since that's the area of a unit um, circle, right? And essentially what we're doing here is, as these rectangles get thinner and thinner, they essentially will approach being a 
quote-unquote one-dimensional sphere, which as we said before is just a line. And what we're doing is we're taking that line and then we're essentially multiplying it by dx and then adding them all together. And we actually do something really similar when we're trying to find the volume of a sphere. And uh, this is going to be really hard to represent since I can't really um, draw a sphere, but I'm just going to do it in the same way. So imagine we have a sphere like this. This is a side view. We're going to chop it up, and each of these cross sections right here is just a really thin cylinder, right? Imagine like a super thin cylinder looking like this with height dx. That's what this is, and then we're going to chop it up in the exact same way. And here you can see we're doing the exact same thing. Each of these little cylinders is just a circle, and then we're multiplying it by dx. So essentially what we're doing every time we solve for the area here, which I'll write the integral out right here, it's going to be the integral from negative 1 to 1 of the area of this, which is going to be dx times a pi um, square root 1 minus x squared squared which is going to be equal to 4 thirds pi. So essentially when we're solving for the area of a sphere, we're taking the, the two, for a three-dimensional sphere, we're taking a quote-unquote two-dimensional sphere, which is just a circle, as I've said before, and then I'm multiplying it by dx and I'm integrating up. So we can kind of generalize this. Um, it's sort of hard to represent it in a different, in uh, higher dimensions, since there's no way to visualize that at all, but we can just um, define another sphere as we can just assume that this pattern will sort of um, continue to hold true. Um, I mean, we can't just assume that, but since it logically makes sense, if we were to try to define what a um, what a hypersphere is, it would really be like passing a normal sphere through the function square root one minus x squared in this way. So I'm going to define that vn of 1 is going to be the integral from negative 1 to 1. All right, and then now we're going to chop it up into little pieces, right? So we're going to have a dx here. And then we're going to have the volume of the sphere, right? Of the vn minus 1 hypersphere. So we're going to have vn minus 1 of uh, square root 1 minus x squared. So I'm going to go ahead and reorganize this here. Um, this is vn1 equals integral from negative 1 to 1. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring out this vn minus 1. And using this property that we have right here, I can rewrite this as 1 minus x squared to the uh, n minus 1 over 2. The over 2 is just because it was a square root. And then I just all raise it to the n minus 1 power using this exact property that we have up here, times vn minus 1 of 1. And I'm just going to go ahead and say that vn is equal to vn of 1. So um, I'm just going to write this as vn rather than vn of 1, since that's what we're really solving for here. And then, of course, we have our dx. And we can also just, since this is going to be an even function, because uh, we have that x squared, we can just multiply by 2. And then let's go ahead and represent this in a better way. Now we have a bit of a recurrence relation, which can help us solve for Vn and find our function for the volume of a hypersphere. We just have to solve for this integral right here. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to say uh, x equals u to the 1 half, dx equals 1 half, u to the 1 minus 1 half, or 1 half minus 1, sorry, du. So this 2 is going to disappear because of that u, and then we're going to have u to the 1 half minus 1, 1 minus u to the n plus 1 over 2 minus 1 du. And this is actually just a representation of the beta function, so we're going to go ahead and sub that in. We have m equals 1 half, and um, our other variable, which I guess I'll just use p, is going to be n plus 1 over 2. So let's go ahead and sub that in. So we're going to have gamma 1 half, which is just equal to square root pi. I'm going to have gamma n over 2 plus 1 half, and all over gamma n over 2 plus 1. 
So this is our relationship right here, and this is how we're going to find our general formula. After all, we have v n, we have v1, v2, v3, so we can go ahead and just uh, plug in and we can get all the later terms. But what we would rather do is just find out a general formula. So one thing that I can notice here is I have this gamma n over 2 plus 1 half and gamma n over 2 plus 1. And I notice that if I replace n over 2, uh, if I replace n with n plus 1, on the top, I'm going to have gamma n over 2 plus 1, and on the bottom, I'm going to have gamma n over 2 plus 3 halves. So we have a sort of telescoping product situation here. So I know that this gamma on the top is always going to cancel with this gamma on the bottom, but I still have this square root pi. So over time, when I'm uh, making this recurrence relation, right? The only thing that's the only change that's going to accumulate is uh, our telescoping term and this square root pi. So I'm going to go ahead and make a guess that Vn is equal to pi to the n over 2 since we're multiplying by square root pi every time divided by gamma of n over 2 plus 1 times some constant. So let's, so let's go ahead and try to prove that this is true and also solve for k at the same time. All right, so let's go ahead and try to solve for our k first. We know that v1 is equal to 2, so let's just plug in 1 everywhere on this formula that we have right here. So we're going to get v1 is equal to square root pi k over gamma of 3 halves. Gamma of 3 halves is just 1 half times gamma of 1 half, which means we're going to have square root pi over 2, and this is equal to 2k. We know that it's also equal to 2, so that means uh, equal to 2, which means k equals 1. So that means that just vn is just equal to pi over gamma n over 2 plus 1. Now let's go ahead and prove this. So we're going to prove this using induction. The way induction works is that we show that it's true for a base case, which in this case is our v equals 1, uh, v1 equals 2, which we already showed. And then we show that um, if this formula is true for n, then it has to be true for n plus 1. So let's assume that this formula is true for n. Then for n plus 1, we know that vn plus 1 is equal to vn square root pi gamma of n over 2 plus 1 over gamma of n over 2 plus 3 halves. Right? Next, let's substitute in our formula for vn which is, oh, uh, this should be not, this should be uh, pi to the n over 2, sorry. Yeah, that looks better. Uh, we're going to get pi to the n over 2 over gamma to the n over 2 plus 1. And immediately we can see that this is going to cancel with that, and we're going to be, n, and we're going to end up with uh, vn plus 1. equals pi to the n plus 1 over 2 over gamma of n plus 1 over 2 plus 1, right? So we have shown that this formula right here, which we are claiming is going to be our formula, uh, holds true for 1. We've proved that, and we've proven that if it uh, holds true for n, then it also holds true for n plus 1. So that means it holds true for 1, that means it holds true for 2, it holds true for 3, it holds true, true for 4, and so, you know, you can um, sort of take steps like that to show that it's true for any integer, and so we've just proved it by induction. So this is our formula for vn, and it's pretty similar to convert this to our formula for vn of r, which is going to be pi to the n over 2 over gamma of n over 2 plus 1, all times r to the n. And this is our formula for the volume of an n-dimensional hypercube. Pretty cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and state that this gamma n over 2 plus 1 is kind of nasty, but it becomes a little bit easier to deal with if we specify if n is even or odd. So for example, for even n, um, for v2n of r, we're going to have pi to the n 
r to the 2n over n factorial, which I think is pretty interesting because um, if you go ahead and sum up all the even, um, the volumes of all the even hypercubes, you can see that we have pi to the n over n factorial. So you're going to end up with like e to the pi, which I think is pretty cool, right? Um, and something, and if we go ahead and use some identities on b to n plus one of r, we're going to find that it's equal to also pi to the n r to the 2n plus 1 over, I believe it's 2k plus 1 double factorial. And instead of pi to the n, it should be and then 2 to the 2n plus 1 or something like that. Um, and you could, guys could figure out for yourself, but there are explicit formulas for um, even and odd numbers. But I just think it's a pretty interesting um, way that we can sort of generalize volume to higher dimensions. You know, this is not something that I'm very experienced with, so it's always fun to sort of dip your toes in and see what you can find out. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Um, if you want to see more stuff like this, talking about higher dimensions and multivariable calculus, I'd be happy to make more stuff like this. If you guys just let me know down in the comments. And yeah, hope I see you in the next video. Bye.